cash buffers are one of the more underappreciated techniques at our disposal to help ensure long-term financial success. When in their most common form of an emergency fund, they can help mitigate the risks of job losses and unanticipated expenses while also helping to keep any anxiety we might feel about our finances in check. But as we've seen in other videos on this channel, they can also be used for so much more than that, especially when they're combined with other techniques. For instance, you can use a cash buffer beyond your existing emergency fund to ride out the first market downturn you experience after reaching financial independence, without having to dip into your actual nest egg and sell your investments when they're at their low point. This technique can actually be beneficial on both the accumulation and drawdown sides of our financial journeys because it raises the minimum safe withdrawal rate we use to determine how much we need to have put away to be considered financially independent, thus allowing us to get there quicker. And it significantly mitigates one of the two most common reasons the safe withdrawal rate method might fail us, which is experiencing a major market downturn shortly after making the transition into FI. We've already discussed how much of a difference utilizing a standard cash buffer can make on our financial picture in previous videos, and how it can be combined with other techniques for maximum impact. But on those videos, you guys raised some interesting questions about the tweaks that could be made to perhaps even get more mileage out of a cash buffer approach. So today, we're going to be going over some of those tweaks to see if they make a noticeable difference to our financial picture. And while we're at it, we'll also take a look to see if these tweaks continue to combine well with other drawdown maximization techniques like financial guardrails and flexible spending budgets, using a wide variety of asset allocations, because again, as helpful as cash buffers can be on their own, we don't really see their true power until they're combined with other synergistic techniques. The tweaks we'll be looking at today are increasing the size of the cash buffer to see how much of a difference it makes and if there's a point of diminishing returns and also refilling the cash buffer after using it the first time to get through a down market. Let's get started. But before we get going, be sure to like this video if you haven't already, as it really does help out the channel a lot, and subscribe with notifications on for more money-related videos like this one every single week. And if you want to further support this channel, you can check out some of the links I've left in the description below, which includes a 30-day free trial of Audible and two free audiobooks of your choice, as well as a list of some books on money I'd recommend checking out with your free trial. In order to get an idea of the impact using a larger or refillable cash buffer has on our financial picture, we first need to understand understand how an investing strategy performs with a more standard buffer approach. Let's look at an all-stock strategy represented entirely by a large cap blend index fund tracking something like the S&P 500. If we assume that we have a cash buffer that's large enough to cover two years worth of survival expenses, which I'm defining as the expenses that you can't get by without paying, in other words, your burn rate or emergency mode expenses, for this video I'm going to assume those are $24,000 a year or around 2.4% of your initial nest egg, and we assume that we use that cash buffer to live on whenever the value of our investments in our nest egg fall by at least 20%. In that case, our minimum safe withdrawal rates for this strategy would come in at 3.66%, 3.53%, and 3.41% for the 30, 40, and 50 year drawdown scenarios respectively. As usual, these rates are before things like expenses and taxes are calculated. Looking at every possible starting year since 1927, someone investing 15% of their income would have reached financial independence about 28% of the time. With savings rates of 30, 50, and 70%, those success rates would jump to 68, 86, and 92% respectively. With a standard buffer, we tended to reach financial independence in 59, 37, 20, and 10 years at those levels of saving respectively. So with that groundwork being laid, we can move on to the tweaks. The first tweak to the buffer that people have made is to make a bigger one. Instead of having two years worth of survival expenses stashed away, they may have three, four, or even five. However, given that building these larger cash buffers also takes time, there might be a point of diminishing returns. With a 3-year buffer, the 30-year minimum safe withdrawal rate jumps to around 3.82%. However, a 5-year buffer only increases that withdrawal rate up to 4.01%. Now, I say only because while that is a noticeable increase, it's not punching much above its weight, so to speak. Under the assumptions we're using, you'd have to put away $48,000 worth of cash to build your 3-year buffer into a 5-year buffer. Based on these figures, and assuming you wanted to live on a $40,000 a year income in retirement, you'd need to have a nest egg valued at around about $1,047,000 with a 3-year cash buffer. With a 5-year buffer, you'd need around $997,500, or about $49,500 less. So by putting away $48,000 towards a larger cash buffer, you're saving yourself from having to build up $49,500 in your nest egg. It's still technically a net positive, but may not be worth the extra time and an effort for many. Running those same calculations for the no buffer whatsoever approach to the one that we're using to build up a two-year buffer, we see that saving that same $48,000 is lowering our required nest egg by over $66,500. 
So again, the returns are diminishing as we increase the size of our cash buffer. The second tweak is to refill your cash buffer once your investments have recovered from their previous crash. The idea is that you will always be able to use the cash buffer to cover your expenses when the market is down, so you'll never actually be selling low. However, it doesn't actually seem to move the needle much. Upon rerunning the simulations with a two-year refillable cash buffer, we find that the minimum safe withdrawal rates are almost identical. The safe withdrawal rates clock in at 3.67%, 3.53%, and 3.41% under these assumptions. The average withdrawal rates across all scenarios actually favored not refilling the bucket, though only by a margin is 0.03%, so either way you slice it, the needle doesn't move much. The reason for this is pretty simple. Generally speaking, over the long haul, your investments are going to grow at a faster rate than cash. I was giving a nominal 2% interest rate to the cash held in the cash buffer in these simulations, which may actually be a bit aggressive in this current climate. But even with that edge, large cap stocks have historically grown somewhere in the neighborhood of 10% per year before inflation over the long haul. Therefore, what we're essentially doing when we refill the cash buffer is taking money out of an asset that's giving us average returns of 10% per year and putting it into something that averages 2% per year. There are times when we can still come out ahead doing that, because the returns of stocks are highly volatile, so an average return of 10% per year can be misleading when projecting growth in any given individual year, or if we're, say, paying off like debt or something, that's lowering our expenses, which can give us benefits in other areas, but since most major downturns don't happen one right after the other, the difference in this particular situation, for capital preservation purposes between refilling and not refilling the bucket, is pretty minimal. And these patterns seem to play out in similar but slightly different ways under different asset allocations. For instance, using the same parameters as we did with the initial cash buffer simulation for the all-stock portfolio, a classic 60-40 allocation would see small drops in both the minimum and average safe withdrawal rates. The minimums fell from 4.1 to 4.05%, and the averages for the refillable bucket trailed the non-refillable scenario by a margin of nearly 0.05% as well. Finally, we need to ask ourselves, does refilling the cash buffer lead to noticeable improvements when the technique is combined with other strategies? Well, it seems that the answer is largely no, and in fact, it's largely the opposite. If we assume that you utilized a standard two-year cash buffer, lowered your expenses all the way down to your inflation-adjusted burn rate whenever the value of your investments fell by at least 20% from all-time highs, and utilized financial guardrails to ensure that your withdrawals stayed within 20% above or below the initial safe withdrawal rate, adjusting your projected withdrawals by 10% any time they fell outside of those guardrails, and instituted a spending floor during normal years, when the markets aren't down big, of $30,000, then the 30-year minimum safe withdrawal rate would rise to something like 8.25%. However, if you refilled the cash buffer, then the minimum 30-year safe withdrawal rate falls to around 8.09%, and the average withdrawal rates fell by roughly the same amount as before. So in the end, are these tweaks worth it? Well, I mean, ultimately, that's up to you to decide for yourself, but based on the numbers that I'm seeing under various conditions and asset allocations, I'd have to say probably not for most people. There is certainly something to be said for possible non-numerical benefits to refilling a cash buffer for some people. I mean, it's a nice feeling to know that you'll likely never have to sell your investments when the market is bottoming out, especially if you've invested in a more volatile portfolio, such as an all-stock allocation, but it just doesn't seem to make enough of a difference for me to get over the drawbacks of lowering my safe withdrawal rate when pairing it with other techniques techniques, and increasing the time it takes for me to reach financial independence. But what do you think? Are there any other tweaks that we could have made to a cash buffer to get more mileage out of it? Let me know in the comments section below. And before I go, I want to give a huge thank you to George Cow, whose generous support over on Patreon is helping to keep this channel in the black. Thank you, George, for helping to support the continued creation of these videos. But that'll do it for me today. Once again, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to smash that like button if you haven't already, subscribe, and hit that bell next to my name so you'll be notified of all my future uploads. I generally upload every single Monday, and if you have a friend that would be interested in this kind of content, be sure to share it with them. Let's really get this information out there and start our own financial revolution.